This video is about the Alexander Subbase Theorem. It's named after the American mathematician James Waddell Alexander. He worked at Princeton and later for the Institute of Advanced Study in the 20th century. By the way, sometimes this is called the Alexander Subbase Lemma. I'm going to refer to it as a theorem here since it's the focus of this video. Here's a statement of the theorem. Let's let xt be a topological space. Let's let script s be a subbase for the topology t. If every open cover of x by elements of s has a finite subcover, then x is compact. So why should mathematicians care about the Alexander subbase theorem? Well, this lemma is useful to prove that an arbitrary product of compact sets is again compact. That's known as Tychonoff's theorem. That involves the axiom of choice. In fact, Tychonoff's theorem is equivalent to the axiom of choice. And in symbols, if you've got any collection x sub alpha of compact topological spaces, then their Cartesian product is again compact with respect to the product topology. Here's a collection of important definitions that are needed to understand and prove the Alexander subbase theorem. We're going to fix a set x and a topology t on x throughout this video. By the way, if you feel comfortable with definitions of a base and a subbase and an open cover and what compact means in a topology class, you could skip ahead if you're just interested in the proof of the Alexander subbase theorem. So we're going to start off with the definition of a base for a topology. So we'll say that a subset B of the topology is a base for the topology if for any open set U in the topology, you could write it as a union of elements from B. Equivalently, for each element X that's in my space and any open set U in the topology that contains X, like my picture over here, we should be able to find a set B in the base such that X is in B and B is wholly contained in U. So for example, if X is the set 1, 2, 3, 4, and I put this topology on it that has the empty set, set 1, 2, set 1, 2, 3, the set 1, 2, 4, and X, then a base for this topology could be just the sets 1, 2, 1, 2, 3, and 1, 2, 4. Next, we're going to define what a subbase for a topology is. So a subset of a topology, we'll denote it by S, is a subbase for the topology if the collection of all finite intersections of elements from script S, so S1 intersect S2 intersect up to SK, if those intersections form a base for the topology. So here's an example. Let's say X is the same set 1, 2, 3, 4. Let's take the same topology T from before. Then a subbase for this topology could just be the two sets 1, 2, 3 and 1, 2, 4. So notice that when you take all finite intersections of those two elements, you obtain the basis B from the previous slide. But also notice that this S, the subbase, is not a base for the topology, since 1 is an element of the set 1, 2, and 1, 2 is an open set, it's in the topology T, but there is no B in S, such that 1 is in B and B is in U. Right, your only choices there are 1, 2, 3, or 1, 2, 4, but neither one of those are contained inside of the set 1, 2. So that shows the difference between a subbase and a base with a pretty simple example. Now let fancy U or script U be a subset of T, so just some collection of open sets here. We'll say that U is an open cover of X if X is equal to the union of all the elements, regular U, and script U. So for example, if X is the real line and T is the usual topology, then we could take script U to be all the open intervals, say A minus one to A plus one, where A is an integer. So intervals that are you know, open, parentheses on both sides, that are centered in an integer. Well, that should cover the whole real line. Since for any real number X, we could take the interval centered at X, um, where the left endpoint is the floor of X minus one and the right endpoint is the uh, ceiling of X. Uh, plus one. And so uh, here we're using the floor function and the ceiling function in case you've never encountered those, like the floor of pi is three and the ceiling of pi is four. We've shown for each element x on the real line that there exists an element u in that cover that I described, 
such that x is in u, and so that's all you need to do to show that x is contained or equal to the union of all these u's. So that's in symbols again, how you prove that a collection of sets is a cover. The next definition we'll need is, what does it mean to say a topological space is compact? And that means that for any open cover u of x, there exists finitely many of the u's, so u1 through un, such that x can be covered by them. So this says that x is compact when any open cover of x has a finite subcover. Like you don't need all the elements from the open cover, you just need a handful of them. And you should be able to do that for every open cover. That's what it means for x to be compact. So for example, again, if x is the real line and t is the usual topology, well then the real line's not compact because the open cover we looked at in the previous slide, where we're taking open intervals that are you know, centered at an integer a of radius one to the left and one to the right, that doesn't have a finite subcover. And so just to try to, to think of a picture here, I've plotted some whole numbers, say, and I'm thinking about the intervals that are centered at those whole numbers. And to see that the real line's not compact, imagine you really only needed a finite number of these intervals, like in my picture. And imagine that R was somehow the union, the whole real line was somehow contained in just these finitely many intervals. Well, what we know that we could do is, we could just go as far right as possible, take the biggest integer in our collection here, which is possible because there's only finitely many by assumption here, but if you go, say, two units to the right of that, well, then that real number is not contained in any of our intervals. So that shows that's, a, that's not a cover. So finally, let's get to the proof of the Alexander subbase theorem. It's a long proof, so get ready. Hopefully by the end of it, you'll have maybe a new understanding that just the textbook alone that you're reading uh, didn't quite get across to you. And so what we're going to do is we're going to do the contrapositive. So suppose that the topological space is not compact. That means that there exists an open cover U that has no finite subcover. And we're going to use that cover U to obtain an open cover of X by elements of the subbase S that has no finite subcover. And if you look closely at the Alexander subbase theorem above, you'll see that, oh yeah, that would be the contrapositive. So consider the following collection of open covers of X. So this is gonna be like a set of sets. It's denoted by fancy P, and it's gonna be all open covers D such that the open cover U is contained in D and X has no finite subcover by elements of D. Now this set P is not empty since well U is one of those sets that are in P. And also P is partially ordered by inclusion. So let's take a totally ordered collection of elements of P. I'll denote them by D sub alpha, where alpha is in some index set I. Remember, totally ordered means that uh, they're all comparable to each other by this uh, relation of inclusion. So all the D alphas eventually are contained in you know, some, bigger, some bigger D beta and so on. So what we're gonna do is for this chain, we're gonna consider the union of all the D alphas in this totally ordered collection. Now observe that the union of all these d alphas is again in the set P, well, because one, I know that u is contained in each individual d alpha, so of course u should be contained in the union of all the d alphas. And two, x has no finite subcover by elements of this union. So we're gonna scroll up. It's like you're watching a lecture at MIT where they have the old blackboards where they, they throw them up one at a time. So I'm. I'm just replace that text up here because it's important for the rest of the proof. So what we're going to do is try to look in a little bit more detail about why does X have no finite subcover by elements that are from the union of these D alphas? Well, we know that the total ordering ensures that any finite collection of elements in this union eventually is gonna be contained in it one specific D beta for some beta and then you know all the betas after that too. Anyway though, once they're all consent contained inside of that bigger set d beta, a consequence of the total ordering, you know that d beta doesn't admit a finite subcover. So we've established that the union of all these d alphas is again in this set p. And that union is an upper bound for that chain uh, d alpha. So it's an upper bound for that, you know, kind of increasing collection of, of, of covers d alpha. 
And what we've shown then is that any chain in P has an upper bound, right? That chain was arbitrary. And now what we may do is invoke Zorn's lemma, which is an equivalent formulation of the axiom of choice. And that allows us to assert that this P has a, at least one maximal element, and we'll call that M. And so to reiterate, M is going to be an open cover of X such that one, U, that cover we started with, is contained in M. Two, X has no finite subcover by elements of M. And those two things just reiterate the qualifications to be in P. But number three is what do we mean by maximal element? And what we're saying here is if script N is another element of P, and if M was a subset of N, then N must be equal to M. So that's trying to get across that M is somehow biggest. And we're gonna leave these criteria up here because we'll use them as we go. So we're gonna finish the proof by showing that M, this maximal cover in some way, intersected with our subbase, that that forms a cover of X. And that wins since two above ensures that X has no finite subcover by elements of the intersection of M with S. Right? If it did, then that would be a subcover by elements of M in particular, which doesn't exist by two. So to show that M intersect X, sorry, M intersect S is a cover of X, you need to show that there exists V in that intersection such that X is in V whenever little x is an arbitrary element of X. Now, we know that M itself is a cover of X since it's in P. So there exists an open set U and M such that X is in U. By the way, if I didn't make it clear a minute ago, I should have started with let X be an arbitrary element of X. And we need to show that there is some open set from M intersect S that contains X. So right now, I know that there exists an element U and M that is a neighborhood of X. And what we need to do is whittle that down to a neighborhood of X that lives in M intersect S. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna utilize that S is a subbase for the topology. So you know U is an element of the topology. So since S is a subbase, there should exist elements S1, S2 through SN in the subbase such that X lives in the intersection of these S's and the intersection of these S's is contained in U. Now we win if we can show that one of these sets, SI, is actually an element of M, because then that SI would be an M and the subbase. So by way of contradiction, suppose that none of these sets, S1 through SN, belong to M. Well, then S1 must be part of a finite cover of X along with some other elements of M. So in other words, there should exist M11. I'm using double subscripts here. The first index refers to which S I'm talking about. So that one refers to S1. And then after that, I'm just saying there's finitely many of these Ms. So there's K1 of them. K1 is some integer. So there are finitely many elements of M uh, such that X is equal to S1 union the rest of those M's. In other words, S1 along with those M's is a cover of X. And like, why can we say that? Maybe that's not clear, but this is why number three above, which I've put at the top here, why that is important. What's that maximal condition about M? Where do we use that? Well, it's used here. All right, if no finite amount of these M's actually existed, then why don't you just throw S1 in there with M? that would be a strictly bigger cover that's an element of P, and it's bigger than M. But it can't be strictly bigger than M because of property three up there. So that means that N that I've built, which is M union S1, would have to be equal to M, but that can't happen since we assumed here S1's not an M. So that's an argument for why there have to exist these finitely many M's such that along with S1, they do cover X. Otherwise you contradict that maximal property. And again, that's kind of the beauty of uh, Zorn's lemma in this proof. So we're gonna repeat this argument for each of the SIs. So we just did that for S1, you could do it for S2 in general, you could do it for SI, and you obtain these sets M I1 up to M I K sub I that all live in this maximal cover M. And again, such that X is covered by SI with all of its corresponding Ms. And now the game is to take the intersection of the S's and throw them together with all of the M's that we just built. And when you throw all those together, 
they cover x. So to see this, observe, when you take the intersection of the s's, union with all the m's that we built here, what we're gonna do is a little math trick, kinda of like adding zero or multiplying by one, we're going to introduce this intersection here in front of the m's. And how you should think about that is it's gonna take the union inside of there, all the m's, intersected with themselves n times, right? So like a set a intersected with itself, it's just the set a again. So again, it's kinda of like multiplying by one, if that makes sense. And the reason we're gonna do that is it allows us to factor that intersection outside, right? The distributive property of how intersections and unions behave. And now when we look at this, this is the intersection of SI with all of the M's, not just the M's that correspond to that particular SI, but all of the M's together. Well, that should definitely be bigger than the intersection of SI together with only the M's that pertain to that particular SI. But inside of that parentheses, those are, that's a cover of X. So this is just the intersection of X with itself n times. And like I said a moment ago, a set intersected it's with itself however many times you like. It's just the set itself, X. So to recover the important parts of this here, what we've shown is that the intersection of the SIs along with all the M's form a cover of X. Now recall that the intersection of all the SIs, those are part of U and U is an element of M. So if we replace the intersection above by U, that shows you that U, union all the M's, that that's a cover of X. But that says that X can be covered by finitely many elements of M, which contradicts that M is in P. That contradicts condition two, the criteria uh, that defines P. Thus, at least one of the SI must be an M. Without loss of generality, let's just say it's S1. So S1's an element of M. Now, since X is an element of all of the S's, well, then X is in S1, and that lives inside of M intersect our subbase S. Now, X and X was arbitrary, so that means that we've shown that M intersect S is an open cover of X that has no finite subcover. In particular, we found an open cover of X by elements of S, right? All the sets in M intersect S are also elements of S. So we found an open cover of X by elements of S that has no finite subcover. And that finishes the proof of the Alexander subbase lemma.